Murphy, and I'm an associate professor at James Cook University in uh, Townsville, Australia. Uh, JCU is a university located in the tropics with a, a vision uh, to try to improve the quality of life of people living in the tropics worldwide. So the work we are doing um, over the last few months with uh, agritourism in the Mekong Delta very much fits this focus on uh, a quality of life in the tropics. So along with uh, two colleagues, Professor Gianna Moscardo and Anna Blackman, we've begun a, a program in partnership with Cantha University uh, to try to look at tourism as a, a tool for community well-being and development in the Mekong Delta. Uh, the literature identifies various barriers to uh, effective community development, um, tourism development in communities, uh, and a lot has been written in this area. Uh, lots of times tourism is put forward as a, a key tool for economic development in regional areas, but in reality, um, those promises do not often come through to regional and rural communities in particular. Some of those barriers include um, a limited um, understanding of tourism um, and analysis of, of the complexities of tourism um, and the markets and, and who participates in it, and therefore limited control over um, the community in, in terms of involvement in the, the planning process for tourism. There's often a lack of coordination of stakeholders at the community level, and in many cases, um, not enough infrastructure exists to develop tourism at an appropriate level. Um, because of the sort of lack of expertise and knowledge at the local level, oftentimes uh, there is a dominance of external agents that are development in the process, which might be government agencies or tourism organizations and businesses, etc. Um, and development can take place on an ad hoc level with no limited or no formal planning, and that often leads to conflict uh, between and within communities over tourism development. Um, Oftentimes, these people that are coming in externally to develop tourism uh, don't give the local community a clear picture of what the potential negative impacts are. So that raises these false expectations. Um, in addition to that, there is uh, financial barriers, limited connection to tourism distribution systems and, and access to tourist markets, um, and, and dependency on government in many cases. Um, and a lack of general skills in terms of problem solving and managing destination communities. So these are uh, well identified and established barriers in the literature. And um, there has been discussion about uh, better ways of approaching tourism development in regional communities. And some people have started to work on uh, a focus on community capital um, and the role of these capitals in developing resilient communities for the future. And so there um, is some progress towards trying to understand tourism and how it can impact on the capitals in a community. And capitals are those resources that a community has around finance, around built infrastructure, around the political system, around the natural environment, and importantly, cultural, human, and social capital. That model can be useful and there is some preliminary work that we have done in trying to apply that in regional communities in tropical Australia. But when we move to a, a setting which includes tourism in developing countries, there's another layer of complexity and challenge that comes into play. Um, so not only uh, do regional areas um, in, in developing countries face those traditional barriers, there's often um, issues around the fact that the people living in those communities don't necessarily understand tourism. They're not um, at a level where they can travel themselves. So while they understand agriculture or health and having um, agencies come in to assist them with that, that's part of their daily life, tourism is something that's harder for them to grasp. And it's difficult for them to achieve um, tourism development than it is um, those other areas of traditional aid-focused development. Beyond that, there's, a, there's barriers around a lack of transparency of, often in how things happen in these countries. Um, political instability is common, a lack of information and data about development issues. Um, in some cases, undemocratic circumstances which make local participation challenging or non-existent at all. 
And then other challenges include um, income inequality, inadequate human resources, low level of capital for investment, uh, dependence on primary products, and issues around levels of favoritism and nepotism and corruption within governments as well. So there is a challenge in trying to identify these frameworks, so the framework of community well-being, which we think has something to offer tourism, and applying it in a situation um, in a developing country. As a case study or and an example of this, the project we've been working on in the Mekong Delta um, is focusing around agritourism. So we have had um, initial meetings and contact with Kantha University, which is in Kantha in the Mekong. This is the southern end of the Mekong Delta in Vietnam, and Kantha is a community of around 2 million people, very much dependent on the river, on rice production, on tropical fruit agriculture, um, and vegetables, etc. Average income is around $2,000 per annum. Uh, so this is an area which has lots of potential, but also is facing lots of challenges. Um, our involvement uh, with this project has come um, through partnership with the Kantha University School of Economics and Business Administration, who have signed an MOU with a particular district in the region, Phong Dien, which has been identified as having potential for agritourism development. So they're working uh, to try to build the capacity of the farmers in that region to connect to tourism. And our role is to help build the capacity of the university and government officials and other key stakeholders to help them achieve um, some of their goals around agritourism development. Uh, so again, a map pointing out where we are situated in the world. The Mekong, Greater Mekong Delta runs through Laos, Cambodia and Vietnam, and Kantha is at the southern end of the, the Mekong in uh, Vietnam, about a three to four hour drive from Ho Chi Minh City. So tourism is not new to the Mekong Delta. There has been uh, substantial investment by aid agencies and NGOs in the region through the Asian Development Bank across uh, Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. And a region adjacent to Kantha has received some of that funding around um, tourism development. But analysis and evaluation of the, by the ADB of those projects, while they generally indicate that they've had some success and positive impact, also identify that there are challenges in the fact that they have not really been successful in distributing the tourism benefits to poor and socially disadvantaged groups, uh, that there is weak national and sub-regional organizational and human resource um, skills, uh, and at that local level that we're talking about, there is weak capacity for the development of tourism products and marketing them, uh, there's limited private sector involvement, uh, there's insufficient infrastructure to spread tourism benefits more widely through the region, um, there is weak capacity for managing ne negative social impacts, there is issues around service quality in many of the tourism businesses, um, and in fact, there's actually uh, weak capacities in the government tourism agencies in terms of officials having an, the, the knowledge they need to undertake basic planning, marketing, and, and developing regulatory systems and to build poverty reduction into their plans. Um, from a sustainability point of view, there's uh, managers of tourism heritage sites lacking competency and knowing how to reduce um, impacts on those sites, and educational institutions themselves responsible for improving knowledge in the tourism sector. Um, those, there's often a lack of training um, and qualified trainers within those organizations. So our focus is really on trying to build the capacity in those education and management sectors. And importantly, the ADB identifies that if these issues aren't addressed, um, there's going to be problems in terms of the competitiveness and sustainability of the tourism sector in the region. So the approach we're trying to follow is this community well-being approach to tourism destination planning, which says we need to look at the capacity um, building needs in the region so that they can develop local government systems, then investigate um, the current status of capitals and where they're facing challenges and what their needs and goals are, and then try to identify possible scenarios where tourism might make the, the contributions they need to improving well-being in those communities. Um, having some sort of system for assessing those scenarios in terms of viability from a, a profitability and sustainability point of view, implementing a scenario and evaluating those outcomes. 
Uh, to date, we've uh, done two workshops. Uh, we've had meetings with key stakeholders and, and several site visits. Uh, the first workshop was focused around with key stakeholders understanding their community and their the capitals and the issues they have and um, looking forward to what they might want to develop. Um, the meetings with stakeholders were about identifying who the players are and where we might get funding. And the site visits are to get a feel for what the experiences are, currently are that are on offer. Um, as I mentioned, that first workshop was focused on the well-being and perceptions of how tourism does and can contribute to it, using appreciative inquiry to really focus on the, the assets that the region has uh, the, and looking for those opportunities. And what we found there is that, um, you know, the main focus is on improving um, using tourism to improve issues around human capital, um, employment, skills, um, reducing impacts on the environment, um, improving infrastructure, um, in increasing educational skills and improving the local quality of life. The district itself that we're looking at, Phong Dien, has uh, some existing products and, and some key individuals that are looking to um, develop or move into uh, the tourism industry. And again, the focus is primarily on tropical fruit orchards, um, where in some cases, visitors can just turn up for a day visit and a short visit to walk through the orchard, sample fruits, maybe eat some food, to others where they started to develop um, varying levels of accommodation and additional activities. And some of the issues that have, have come um, to light through these site visits are that there tends to be one or two key individuals within uh, a community. So the district itself has um, separate communities and those kind of individual entrepreneurs by fact of inheriting land or um, having for some reason had access to capital and, and have an orchard, um, have English language skills because uh, they've been abroad or have some connections tend to be the ones that start the development. Um, but then uh, we really um, need to look at do they understand tourist needs? So often they have, will build something, have it sitting there waiting for tourists to arrive without really having um, had the market research and um, understanding of who who should these tourists be? How do we access them? Uh, what's our return on investment? What, what's a break even point, etc. And what do tourists, domestic and in this case are trying to attract international tourists, really expect of an agritourism experience? What level of quality and standards and necessities do they have? And also, um, not a whole lot of thought has gone into the impacts on, on neighbors. So um, the communities are very small. Um, you can't access any of these, these um, sorts of orchards without walking through and past um, where people live. So there's individuals wanting tourism, but it's not clear what the rest of the community thinks. Um, Moving in and through the region is primarily by boat, so it's not easy access, but that is part of the experience. So there is need for integrating and developing systems and infrastructure to get people around. Um, and as you start to move through the region, you can see there is some repetition and experience and there is, again, things being built or money plans being developed to um, expand and develop accommodation but with no clear business planning associated with it. It's uh, if people give us money, we can build this, but there's not any vision beyond building those things. Um, so uh, there needs to be some work on um, within the region and itself and across the Mekong Delta regions. Uh, what are the experiences that we're developing? Let's not just replicate what has been done elsewhere because that is really not going to increase length of stay or attract new visitors. Um, and food is very much a focus of that and is, is a key theme that should be developed. Uh, the region does have um, floating markets. There are two within the region. The one in the Phong Dien district is much more authentic to a certain degree um, and definitely an interesting experience. But there is really, uh, you go on a, in a, a tour or a, a boat, you have a, a driver, but there's no interpretation, there's no information um, beyond basic um, levels about what, what you're seeing and what you're experiencing. So there's definitely room uh, to develop language and interpretation and storytelling skills. And there's lots of opportunities for unique products around food. Um, the food is very much a part of the culture, but it is very foreign to um, the average visitor. And again, unless you're with somebody <laughs> that knows, it's difficult to know what you're eating, um, what's safe to eat, etc. 
there's also issues around understanding what tourism um, they are developing. To, sustainable tourism is used in a term, ecological tourism, ecotourism, agrotourism, and it's not clear what their definitions of, are, of those things are, and they don't often seem to line up with, with uh, perceptions we might have. So there's some images here that are just an example of one um, ecological tourism experience, which is a fruit orchard, which also had a, a pond, a gated, a fenced pond with about 300 crocodiles in it. Um, the skeleton here is a doorway to hell, um, so it was like a fun house theme park. Um, and then there was a domestic uh, corporate trip there where they were playing uh, games, throwing balls into buckets and winning soft drinks and, and cakes. Um, it was a very eclectic mix of experiences and not one that we'd probably associate with ecological tourism. So uh, a lot of what they have done to develop uh, experiences for the domestic market uh, may not easily translate to international tourism and uh, there is definitely not a lot of clear theming or guidelines around what qualifies for some of these experiences. So these issues around of lack of clarity around labels attached to similar experiences, inconsistency in, in the use and termino terminology, a reliance on inbound tour operators to bring people to the region with not really understanding you know, where they're coming from, what their needs are, or how you can extend a stay. Um, and that's because of a lack of control over the distribution system and not having a regional uh, cooperative focus to accessing tourists and understanding their needs and what sorts of international tourists would be most appropriate to contribute to the, the improvements in quality of life that they have, the lack of business planning and you know lack of clarity around the role of local and regional tourism authorities are all issues. And we also really need to question if we're there um, and working to try to improve community well-being, um, we're improving well-being from what to what and who benefits and who misses out. So again, this image shows uh, two houses, very different, only 50 meters apart. So um, improving, definitely the picture on the right, we can see that we need to improve the quality of life um, and some issues around power and sanitation and um, clean water for that. But just down the road, um, is a mansion and there's somewhere in between is probably where the sustainable point is and where uh, good community well-being and quality of life could be but who decides that and how do we work out um, making sure that everybody is benefiting from tourism not just those that have the power and the access so the second workshop focused more on this um, understanding uh, what we need to know and who we need to know it from. So developing a research agenda with staff and students from the university, which focused on identifying the stakeholders, looking at issues about how we access the broader community. And we have to do that through people's committees, which leads to issues about the residents feeling that they can be open and they can have trust in that system. And also issues around access to funding these sorts of who's going to fund the research um, but we hope that by working with the local academics and students that um, we'll have a better chance of embedding that and in, in involving the community um, but on all parts there needs to be a sense of ownership and commitment from the locals who uh, because of uh, political structures and, and history um, are used to having people come and do things for them and tell them what's happening rather than taking ownership themselves. So where to next? Um, there has been some criticism of academics coming and going, doing one-off studies in places that really don't benefit the locals, and that's definitely what we do not want to do. So we realize we need to have um, spend time, a longer time frame in that location and to narrow down where we are focusing on and try to understand that community and, and how applying a model like community capitals and well-being fits there, what does it mean, how do you get them to engage with that. Um, but obviously, um, somebody sitting there that has built a, a cabin for tourists to, to turn up and invest in their own personal income doesn't have a two, three, five year plan for that to be full. So we have some tensions in terms of um, our access to resources in terms of time and money, but also wanting to benefit those local people. So the way forward is definitely not um, straightforward. It is complex. And this image is typical Vietnam, which shows um, to the level of complexity and the, the fact that these things can be fraught with danger in the sense that 
uh, we want to make sure that uh, they have clear expectations about what tourism can and cannot do um, and, and can make more informed choices about that and in some cases make decisions about what not to do for tourism or not to have tourism at all or at what scale they want tourism. So the way forward is not clear, but hopefully by working from with the local stakeholders um, in a long term uh, time frame, we might get somewhere towards improving quality of life.